Well, our last speaker before lunch has a list of achievements that I hopefully will really work up an appetite. Yes, it's Mark Colborn, MBE, who's the world and Paralympic champion. And before we get to meet Mark, here is a video of how Mark turned nothing into something. Take a look. of South Wales, the town of Tredegar on the Sirhoe River. Born of the Industrial Revolution, this was a steel town that helped build the Britain of today. Recently, one son of Tredegar has been forging more precious metals, forging and re-engineering. This is the story of Mark Colborn, Margaret's boy, who faced the greatest challenge of his life stared it down and propelled himself to the top of the world. Once a triathlete, climber and paraglider, Mark's life changed forever when over the sands of South Wales his paragliding canopy collapsed and he crashed to the ground. The canopy reinflated and dragged Mark a further 80 metres. He was rescued by the Wales Air Ambulance. His back was broken. Nearly a hundred days motionless in hospital, countless hours of rehabilitation and therapy. But a new opportunity. Refusing to allow his injuries to limit or define him, Mark looked to a former love, cycling. Fast forward just 18 months, he is a world champion. But there's more to come. The games of that wonderful summer of 2012, and Mark Colborn brings home two silvers and a gold. The hero's welcome followed. So too did an MBE. The Royal Mail saluted him too. Margaret's boy had done good. And now, a new journey. Mark sharing his incredible story with delegates and guests at international events and conferences. Inspiring, uplifting, entertaining. Mark's forthright and warm approach, coupled with a powerful presentation and eloquent style, delivers a tailor-made message to any event. And what I would like to say, first of all, is my presentation is entitled How I Turned Nothing Into Something. How I Turned Nothing Into Something. And what I would like to share with you as business owners, chief executives, managing directors, is if what you hear from me in the next 35, 40 minutes, please, please, Get in touch, because I would really, really love to hear how my story has maybe, maybe influenced you and your employees, your staff, your managers, because this, as we all know, is a, a fantastic way of keeping in touch. So please, please share with me your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, I don't want your profits, you can keep those. When I was growing up in South Wales, this gentleman was certainly the biggest inspiration for me, and he was known as Mr. Nice Guy, because believe it or not, not to state the obvious, but as much as we love the technology that we live around today, we're all still human. So you still have to have a passion or an inspiration in life to ensure that you, you get out of bed and you achieve great things in life. 
So I ask you this, who is your Mr. Nice Guy? Mr. Nice Guy taught me from a very young age, as you can see. This is my impression of me trying to be Bear Grylls at the age of five. And what Mr. Nice Guy taught me was the inspiration that if you have a dream in life, never, never give up. So what does that mean? What does that really mean? What I'd like to do is I'd like to take you back. I'd like to take you back to 2009, when life for me at the time, I thought, was almost perfect. My passions were rock climbing, racing triathlon quite regularly, so those were my passions. At the time, I was almost 95 kilograms, so I was quite heavy. Quite heavy. But my biggest passion of all was paragliding. Hands up. Hands up. How many of you have always wanted that Peter Pan moment? We've always wanted to fly. That feeling that you get as a human being, remember, we are, we are humans. That feeling you get is like no other feeling when you're flying amongst the clouds. Now, this picture was taken on May the 2nd, 2009, when I was flying in my country, in Wales. And this is me in the center above a beautiful beach called Rossilly. So I'm flying along under my blue canopy. And we'd been flying all day. And at around 5 p.m., one of the other pilots said to me, shall we go back up? Because we'd had about four hours of flying time all day. And, and we love this word hindsight, don't we? I said, yeah, of course. So we launched the canopies. And as we're flying along the cross of the top ridge, unfortunately, I flew into what is known as a crosswind which is almost like black ice in the air. And unfortunately, as I'm flying, my canopy actually collapsed. I'm almost 15 meters above the ground, weighing in at 95 kilograms. So you can imagine what happened next. Within two seconds, I'd hit the floor, feet first, didn't realize what I'd actually done to my amazing body. And then the canopy reinflated and dragged me for almost 80 meters. So I'm lying on the floor and I'm staring up at the ceiling of the sky and thinking to myself, wow, am I still alive? And then I open my eyes and just thinking, wow, that was close. And then I tried to sit up and I couldn't get my shoulders off the floor. And then I tried to move my legs and thought, why can't I move my legs? And then I thought, maybe, maybe I've just broken both my legs, but it was so close. And then one of the paragliding pilots came flying down and landed, unclipped his harness and ran over to me. And I'm looking at him, blinking. And his first words to me were, Oh my God, are you still alive? And my words were, Dennis, I cannot move. So immediately, he radioed for the Wales Air Ambulance. And within 20 minutes, they arrived and they started working on me, putting a morphine line into me and stabilizing me onto the spinal board. And after one hour, I was flown to hospital and arrived in the hospital to be wheeled into the accident and emergency unit. And the consultant said to me, Mr. Colborn, we have to get you into the x-ray and the MRI scanner to determine exactly what you've done because we're unsure of what you've done. I said, please, just tell me what I've done. I can accept change. I'm 40 years of age at this point. I understand and accept change. The same as you in your business. You have to accept change because it's happening every single day. Accept it 
and move on. So after one hour, I had my x-ray and I had my MRI scan, and then two nurses came along with these very large scissors, and they started cutting my trousers off me, and I started crying, profusely crying, and the lady said to me, it's okay, Mr. Colborne, don't cry, you're actually in good hands. I said, that's okay. Do you know how much these trousers cost me? So after a few hours of more tears, my parents arrived, my mother's crying, I'm crying, my dad is crying, and my dad leaned over to me, and his words were, I told you. Because in life we take risks, we take calculated risks, however, you never, ever know what's going to happen. So that evening, the consultant came to my bedside, and I said, Mr. Jones, can you tell me exactly what I've done? He said, Mr. Colburn, what you've done is that you've broken your back. You've broken your back. Now, at this point, my life literally just flashed before my eyes because I'm thinking, does that mean I'm never going to walk again, run again, paraglide, canoe, rock climb? What was going to happen with my life? What was going to happen with my life? And when somebody gives you this kind of news, that's when psychologically you start to become desperate. So the very first morning of waking up in hospital, staring at the ceiling, thinking, am I ever, ever going to get out of this bed? And I ask you this, how many of you really enjoy your days off when you're lying in bed with your papers and your coffees? And then you think, yeah, okay, I'll just go downstairs and get more coffee. When somebody takes away your functionality, that's when it starts to become really difficult. Because I say this to you, if somebody steals your nice watch, you go and buy another watch. If somebody steals your nice car, you buy another car. However, when somebody takes away your functionality, as good as Amazon and eBay is, you cannot buy another set of legs. So for me, lying there, not knowing if my life was ever going to become what it was. I kept thinking of the words that my dad taught me when I was a little child, that if you want a dream, never give up. And I never gave up. From the moment that they actually lifted me out of the bed, after 94 days of lying on my back, paralyzed, to be taken into the gymnasium on a frame to learn to walk, again. So after six months of lying in hospital, not knowing where my life was going to go, I made the decision, because I remember reading this, every single human being on this planet is naturally, naturally born happy, but you choose to be unhappy. So when you're motivating your staff and you're talking to your people and you're explaining, you know, about how hard they need to work, instill into them the purpose of happiness. Because in my life, if I'm happy, not having any money, which I didn't have, not having a job, which I didn't have, I was divorced, so life was perfect. We overcome challenges every single day from the moment we are born. So when people say to you, oh, I've really had a tough day today, are you having a tough day because you've been practicing since the day you was born to overcome different challenges? So for me, to try and overcome this challenge really, really tested me. It really did. So surely this picture sums up that we're actually born happy, but we choose to be unhappy. I kept saying to the doctors, can you explain to me what's going on in my body? Because I understand I've broken my back. 
I understand that I'm learning to walk again on, on crutches and frames, but can you tell me why my feet don't work? And the gentleman said, you've got what is known as drop foot. So you've got no push or no pull in both feet due to the nerve damage in your back. I said, okay, I understand that, but why is it that I cannot plant my feet properly? He said, what you've done is you've damaged all the nerves in your bum muscles and your hamstrings. So there wasn't really that much going for me at this point, was there? However, I never gave up. So I said to Mr. Inman, the consultant, okay, so what can I do? I understand that I can't run or skip, but what can I do? Surely, because I have a pulse and this is working. So the consultant said, can you do a ballerina squat? I said, yes. Do it again, and again, and again, and again. He said, what's happened is that even though you've damaged all the nerves to your feet, your hamstrings, and your bum muscles, what's not been affected, thankfully, is your quads. Now, these are actually my legs, by the way. They're not Sir Chris Hoy's. So what I actually focused on was what I could do rather than what I couldn't do because I knew when I left hospital that I could actually pedal, albeit very slowly. So with the help of special ankle supports, which I have to wear, that enabled me, using new technology, to give me that new life. So for me, life was all about ability, not disability. And then one day, I was actually taking part in a, a charity cycle ride to raise money for the Wales Air Ambulance who saved my life. And one of the riders asked me about my disability and I explained that I'd broken my back 12 months previously. And he, he asked me, so what do you do? And I said, well, I've not gone back to work. I've decided to just get myself this human being, this trillion dollar body back into shape. And he said to me, are you training for the London Paralympics? I said, no. He said, I think you should. I said, why do you say that? He said, my name is Dr. Ben Matthews and I'm a chiropractor and I understand your body, how much damage you've actually incurred, but I've never seen anybody ever with so much power and endurance as a human being, albeit with a disability. And it was at that moment that the light bulb went off. It was the Steve Jobs moment that I thought, I've got two years, two years to maybe, just maybe, get to the London Paralympics. Because if I could get myself as fit and as strong as what I was, before my accident, then I maybe, just maybe, could get to the London Paralympics. So I wrote down a plan of how would I get there. First of all, I had to lose a lot of weight, almost 15 kilograms. And then I started to cycle every day and just repeat the process, as we heard earlier on. Because we're creatures of habit and we always do what we've done, which is gonna get us into where we want to be. So I started repeating the process because my dad always told me that if you want your life to change, you have to change. So what did that actually mean for me as an individual to pursue this dream? What that meant was for the next two years, no chocolate, no alcohol, no sex, for two years. No partying. I loved partying. But all that compromise was hopefully gonna get me into the place where I really, really wanted to be. So one year later, after losing my 15 kilograms, we then approached British Cycling through a special disabled cycling charity in Wales. And they said, okay, what we will do is we'll give Mark the opportunity as a guest rider, because we're 12 months from the London Paralympics, 
as a C1 rider, which is the most disabled out of all of the categories, to come and race for Great Britain in five races across the summer of 2011. I came back with five medals. I came back with five medals. So straight away, they took me to the World Road Championships in Roskilde in Denmark. I came back with a silver medal in the time trial. I was then elevated to the Paralympic Academy to live and train full time for British cycling in Manchester with the best sporting organization on the planet. The best doctors, physiologists, biomechanics, coaches, nutritionists that I could ever wish for. So I say this to you, who is your support network? Who is your team around you that can help you to become world class? Call on these people, don't ignore them. As we were told earlier on, with regards to the thinkers and the doers, I've never been a thinker, but I tell you what, if you want somebody to make it happen on your team, give me a call. So straight away, after training with British Cycling, every single day, I'm now thinking that I've won the lottery. And then I received possibly the worst phone call in my life of my dad to say, unfortunately, he'd been into hospital for tests with his chest. And he'd actually contracted stomach cancer. Now, when somebody gives you that type of news, you suddenly think, what's the worth of me living? What's the worth of me carrying on with this life that I'm pursuing and this dream I'm pursuing? And then I was selected to go and race in Los Angeles in the World Track Championships, February 2012. My dad had been given three months to live at this point. And in here, I genuinely didn't want to go. My dad said to me, you will go, son. You will go and win that World Championship gold medal for me. I couldn't resist. So I went to Los Angeles and I won my World Championship gold medal. However, uh, when I was actually there, I received a phone call from my mother to say that my dad had passed away when I was there. And these are all the trials and tribulations in life. But as we all know, life goes on. And as a responsible athlete representing my country, I couldn't give up. So my question to you is, what are you prepared to give up to become world class? If you're not achieving your dreams, your aspirations, your profits, what do you have to give up? Because life at the top is all about compromise. And my mother said to me, when I said I was going to just stop, she said, what would your dad want you to do? I said, probably carry on. So she said, what are you going to do? I'm going to carry on. So I then looked at my monthly training regime. How could I get myself into the best possible shape of my life within this 12-month period? My coach said to me, Mark, we need you to be riding about 100 kilometers per day, which is probably about three hours of cycling. I said, Tom, I've got the rest of the day to do nothing. I'm going to up my training. I'm going to do extra training. I'm going to look at the marginal gains in my sport. Now, if you think of the motion of actually riding a bike, it doesn't start with the pedaling. It starts with the grip before the pull, before the force, before the pedal start to move. So straight away, I started doing strength exercises and pulling exercises because these are the marginal gains in my sport that makes that difference. So my question to you is, look at those marginal gains. Do something different and go that extra mile. So I started cycling and doing 100 miles every day, 165 kilometers every day, every day, every day, every day. And you may be thinking, wow, 
that's actually quite far. It's actually Wales to Moscow every month. And when you get there, you've got to come back. So that was the amount of training that I needed to do, which got me to the London 2012 Paralympics. All of that training, all of that compromise, no chocolate, no alcohol, and that nearly killed me. But that's the marginal gains and the compromise that we need in business. Now, thanks to digital photography, this picture was taken within 15 minutes of me arriving in the London 2012 Paralympic Village. I was there. I was finally there. My dream was becoming a true reality. Because whatever was going to happen, I had to ensure that my grandchildren, who will no doubt be looking at these photographs, probably on their watch in years to come, that their granddad was there. So for me, all the hard work was now done. As human beings, we were made to move. We were made to move. Put in the effort, get this heart beating. It was now time to perform not only for my country, but for my dad. So the very first day of competition, I remember reading this in my notes. The very first day of representing my country at the London 2012 Paralympics. And I'm reading it and I'm thinking, what if I fail? What if I fail? But I say this to you, it's actually okay to come second. It's okay because of this reason. If you, if you give 99% in your activities and you fail, you have to live with that disappointment for the rest of your life. However, if you give 100% and you fail, that's okay. That's okay. Because you've given it everything. So you have to be proud of what you've achieved. So on my very first day in the London Velodrome, I won my very first Paralympic silver medal. Just to let you know, in the morning I broke the world record and then my friend from China stepped onto the track and broke it again. Thanks. <laughs> but I had to accept that I'd been beaten. So if you do everything in your, in your power to achieve great things and somebody else comes along and betters you, Accept it and move on. Learn from it, naturally, but move on. So then it was on to the 10-mile time trial, or 16 kilometers, to be beaten again by 12 seconds. 12 seconds over 16 kilometers. And that really hurt, because I had given it absolutely everything to get there. So even in times when you're working hard and you're, you're striving for amazing things, don't give up. Because you never know where it's going to lead. As the world champion in the three kilometer pursuit, which is 12 laps of the velodrome, in the morning, in qualification, our friend from China, Yang Zi, had broken the world record. And my coach, when we had our briefing, said to me, Mark, this guy is really fast. I said, Tom, it's okay. It's okay. I know my ability. I know what I can achieve. Now, as the world champion, I get to ride last. So I get to see everybody's times from that morning. And Tom said to me, so tell me, what, what are you going to do? How are you going to approach this race? I said, Tom, I'm going to go out and smash it. But Mark, you have to replicate it then in the final. I said, Tom, that's fine. Leave that with me. So that morning, I actually went and broke the world record 
by seven seconds, just to ensure that when I got to the final, the Chinese rider was absolutely scared out of his skin. And then it was on to the final, and I kept thinking to myself, what if I fail? What if I fail? But I had this idea, this passion running through me that I wasn't going to fail. I was going to win. I was going to win. But the fear of failure was a great motivator for me. It really was. So I'd like to take you to the London 2012 Paralympic Games and the final of the three-kilometer pursuit. Think about this for one moment. It was two years of compromise, two years of hard work, two years of blood, sweat, and certainly lots of tears. So even in your place of work, when you're going through tough times and you're pulling your hair out and you're throwing your iPhone on the floor because it doesn't work, just stop for one moment. Just stop. And just revisit who you are and what you're trying to achieve just for one moment. A gentleman this morning said, quite rightly, we are living in the times where everything happens now, 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 now. However, press the pause button just for a few seconds. Take a breath. And then focus. So who would like to see what happened in the final? That's not enough hands, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, picture the scene. It's the Olympic velodrome. Six and a half thousand people crammed into this stadium. The atmosphere was amazing. 1.2 million people watching me on the TV. So no pressure. And then they called my name and my number, which was number 42, which was my age. Now, is that a coincidence? Unfortunately, I walk like Charlie Chaplin because of my disability. Some of you may not know who Charlie Chaplin is. And then I positioned myself on the bike in the start gate. Click, click, in went the pedals. I'm holding on to the handlebars, and I'm looking round. Now, the race doesn't start until the both riders are ready. And I looked over, and the red flag was up to say that the Chinese rider was ready. And I thought to myself, the race will start when I'm ready. So I'm holding on, and the silence dropped. And my coach walked round to the front of my bike, and he put his hands onto my handlebars. And he said, are you ready? I said, you bet. He said, do this for your dad. And he walked off. I just thought, this is my time. This is now my time to prove to the world that all that compromise was worth it. it was all worth it. And as I'm focusing on my breathing, I'm thinking to myself, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And then before I knew it, the beep started. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> and the gun went, and I started to accelerate. Now, with my disability, I cannot start the bike very quick. It takes me two laps to get up to speed. And then when I'm up to that 45, 46 kilometers an hour, I can then settle, because that's my office. And anybody who steps into my office has to give it 100% or leave. And I'm pedaling really, really hard. And as I looked up at my coach, my coach does this. I thought, oh no, I'm behind. Keep focusing, keep focusing, don't lose focus. Keep pedaling, keep pedaling. On lap six, I came around. He's still doing this. I'm thinking, Mark, you cannot fail, you cannot fail. Keep pushing, keep pedaling. 
201 beats per minute on my heart rate. And then on lap 10, I came around the corner looking at my coach, he does this. I thought, yes, I'm nearly there. And then on a lap 11, this happened. Mark Tobin, who broke his back in a paragliding fall when his wing collapsed and he fell 40 feet. That was in May 2009. In August 2012, he's about to become a Paralympic gold medalist. Look at him fly. This, it might, he might not even reach it. Yes, it will, just about. He won't catch him in three kilometres. The bell has gone for the last lap. Yeah, the coach has given up on telling what schedule he's on. He's just pointing at the Chinese rider. Go and catch him. He's closing in rapidly, and he might just get on his slipstream as he comes off this banking into the finishing straight. He's 100 metres behind him as he lines up for the finish. The world record has just gone by, but he doesn't care. He, oh, my God, it hasn't. It hasn't. It's one. It's, I'll have to work it out. It's about 11, 11 hundredths of a second. He's got the world record again. Incredible. What a way to win a gold medal. Set in them, you know, beat your own world record. You can't go better than that. Two world records and a gold medal from two performances today. Mark Coburn has got his gold in the best possible style. I guess to be stood here today as a, a very proud Paralympic gold medalist and winning this medal for my dad means everything to me. So if anybody in life says to you that dreams don't come true, maybe my story will make you think differently. The other thing that I was given as a Paralympic gold medalist was my own stamp. This was not on my wish list. The other thing that was not on my wish list was my very own gold post box which we were given in the United Kingdom for winning our Paralympic gold medalist, which is an amazing opportunity to leave my footprint behind for the future generations. However, look at the picture. There's somebody missing off there. There's somebody missing. And we miss him dearly, we really do. Now, in the UK, we get awarded very special awards for our services to various industries, you know, sports and stuff. And Christmas 2012, I received a letter from the Queen to say, congratulations, Mark Colborne, you've been awarded the MBE for your services to cycling. So I read the letter, and at the bottom of the letter, it said in big, black, bold font, do not disclose this letter to anyone. So I thought, okay. So I put the letter away. And then on the 1st of January, my mother rang me in my house. And this was the conversation. And I love sharing this story with you. Good morning, ma'am. Happy New Year. Are you okay? I've just been told by John Simmons, who is her neighbor, that you've been awarded the MBE for your services to cycling. I said, yeah, that's great, ma'am, isn't it? And why didn't you tell me? I said, well, the letter I had of the Queen said, do not disclose this letter to anyone. But I'm your mother. <laughs> True story. So to take my mother to Buckingham Palace, probably the most popular house in the world, to watch her son, who had gone through hell and back, to be awarded an amazing medal by Prince Charles. It was a great moment for her, indeed, it really was. Now, we, we all know about USPs, but for me, life is all about ideas and innovation and turning nothing into something. But to do it, you have to have sincerity. It has to be real and tangible, that you can touch it, feel it. I almost felt I was a world champion at least six months before I wore that gold medal. And the one thing you have to have is passion, because as human beings, 
you have to have passion. You really do. And I genuinely feel that my, my opportunity that I was given all through my life-changing accident, the opportunity that I had in the London 2012 Paralympics has turned into a responsibility. And now as a professional speaker, having retired from cycling, for this reason, to help others, I have my gold medal, I have my MBE and my world record. I now want to help others to aspire their goals and hopefully achieve their dreams. Who would have ever thought this was possible four and a half years ago? But through doing something different and focusing on what I could do rather than what I couldn't do, led me on to great things, all through being happy. All through being happy. So what I'd like to do first of all, before we take just a few questions, is just think about this. The next time you're having a really bad day, just stop and think about the 94 days that I spent completely paralyzed on my back. I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm not looking to impress you. I'm trying to inspire you to help you achieve great things. So when you are having that bad day, think to yourself, am I really having a bad day? Am I really having a bad day? The next slide was something that I found on the internet, thankfully, because this changed my life forever because you keep telling yourself that we are human beings. But remember, the best dreams happen when you're awake. So can we take some questions, please? Maybe three or four questions, if anybody has any. Thank you very much to Mark, first of all. Big round of applause, Mark. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Really fantastic story. Yes. I think you can sense the warmth of their applause, actually, how inspiring your story has been. And I think Mark and London 2012 Olympics was very powerful, not only in the UK, but in the rest of the world. I think Mark has been responsible for showing that disability doesn't get in the way, does it, of ability. No, no, and much. I think you are case in the point, so we applaud you for the work you've done. And the other thing that I think is incredible is that mindset. You know, we're used to habitual things, but you proved that you could step outside the usual mindset, our normal behavior, and dream of something that was impossible. I mean, Mark will be around to answer questions, but I'm just going to quickly look to the audience to see if anybody would like to ask Mark a question in front of everybody else. So put your hand up. Oh, there's a gentleman there. I think Hi. it's a gentleman. It's very hard to see with the lights. It is, I can confirm. Yes, I am a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> and lovely to hear, have to hear your question. Uh, hi. hi, my name is Przemek. Hi. And uh, Mark, I'm uh, very excited about your, uh, your speech and uh, you inspire me already. But uh, I wonder what is your next challenge? What is, what's your big, biggest challenge right now? Uh, I think, I think my biggest challenge, as the gentleman said this morning, if you're in a room with 10 people, then you inspire 10 people. However, for me, if I can present my story and, and help to fix people's problems in front of 300, 500, 1,000 people, then it's only a matter of time before I pass away that everybody gets to, to hear my story and how being positive and happy, you know, can actually help in life. And I say this to you, you know, when you have a, an iPod or an iPad or a, an Apple Mac that breaks, it doesn't fix itself, does it? And yet this trillion dollar machine that we walk around in every single day, you know, is, is far superior than, than any other machine on the planet. And that's not patronizing technology, because I love technology. But let's just stop and think for one moment before the future carries on faster than we can catch up with it. That we're in control of that. So for me, it's inspiring and helping others to achieve great things, certainly in business as a professional keynote speaker. 
So and thank also, you for your question. It's a very good question. And also, I, I can imagine, although you look pretty fit and trim still, that chocolate, alcohol and sex is now something you can do. Only on a Saturday. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Any other questions <laughs> that you have for Mark? Hi. Gentlemen here, if we can get the microphone to you. Good afternoon to you. If you can introduce yourself to the audience as well. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I would like to ask you uh, if, you would uh, if you will have a second life. Uh, will you take the risk and make your flying dream? Yes, I would. Because think of this. When I was working as a, an accounts manager for business to business, nobody listened to me. Nobody listened to me. However, when you go through life-changing experiences and you almost face death, you know, face on, people then will start to listen to you because it's, it's so difficult to try and go through those really, really low times to come back to achieve great things. So, so now my, my point is that I wouldn't change it, not that we ever could, because that's the wonderful word we have, hindsight. Uh, will you take up paragliding again, or is that one thing you've, you've seen it before, you've done it, <laughs> you've been there? I promised... Um, I promised my parents and my daughter when I was in hospital that if I ever got out of the, that bed, would I ever fly again? And I said, no, I'll promise you I would never do that because I know, even though I've lost my dad, that my mother would be living in fear. She knows I'm here today, okay? Is she no, in the audience, no, by no, the way? No, 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 no. <laughs> nobody tweet that Mark is flying today, OK? <laughs> no, don't do it. No, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that Thank question. You. Thank you. Any other questions for Mark? I mean, Max, if we can bring, get Max's um, microphone up. A truly inspirational story. And I know you love strategy and innovation for the ambitious. You can't get more ambitious than this, can you, that's turned nothing into something? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it, brought um, a couple of things to, to light. To, well, one was just this general idea that um, it, it's, it, it's one of those classic things about ability and ambition, really. So with a really clear goal, if you have enough ambition, you just get there. So you have a two-year period where you do nothing but focus on this one goal, and as long as you can pedal fast, and do this very clearly defined thing, you succeed, right? And so it's the making of you. But it really is that high ambition, high ability. It'll be very interesting to see what happens next, though. And when you're dealing with uncertainty, when you don't know what the goal is, how can you work really hard towards it? And I think that's one of the, the differences sometimes between this kind of experience and sometimes what other people are facing before they find a really clear goal. Would you uh, sort of relate to that as well? Because you had a clear goal, determined goal, that world championship in sight, and it's that marginal difference, isn't it? Yeah, I think for many people in life, you know, if, if people are working very, very hard every day and they want to turn nothing into something, well, as the gentleman said, you have to have that passion, you have to have that idea, it has to be tangible, you have to almost see it before it actually happens. You know, I broke the world record nine times before I got to the Paralympics in my sleep. So I almost reenacted out what was actually going to happen. So for many people who have these ideas about the future, don't be afraid to put them into place. Because if you take action and you monitor it, you can then change it if you need to. Well, Mark, it's been fantastic having you. I know we've got a gift for you oh, as well. Thank you. Bar of chocolate. It is, hopefully, it will be a bar of chocolate <laughs> or a load of pizza that all the speakers have been given. Okay. It's, there we go, presenting to you, thank you your very own much. special gift. And I, I, hopefully, you're not flying back by Wizz Air because your mum would be very, very worried <laughs> indeed. Can I give you that? Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And there's thank a you gift very to much. you. Okay, thank you. Cheers. The one and only Mark thank Colburn. Thank, thank you, Mark. You. Terrific guy. Thank you.